Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is part of the awesome stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series. And I am super happy to have Leonardo Dos Santos with us today. Hey, Leo. Hello. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty fine. And it is October 30th of 2023 as we record this. So we are one day before the uh, American holiday of Halloween. <laughs> so I heard. Yeah. This Almost impossible not to notice it if you're in the U.S. Or Dio de Muerte, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Uh, and Leo, where, where are you located at? I'm currently in Baltimore, in Maryland, cool. the northeast of the United States. Mm -hmm. And But I'm originally from Brazil and South America. And I've been here in Baltimore for about two years now. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, is the weather turning in Baltimore? Or are we already in fall? Or are the trees turning? Well, yeah, they turn, but as typical Maryland behavior, it's warm again. It almost feels like summer again. It it warmed up this weekend. Oh, it warmed you. up up to the eighties this weekend, and right now, right now, seventy six. Okay, <laughs> doesn't really feel like fall in Phoenix. We call that cool. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so so we are actually cooling down. We're actually entered into our fall here in Phoenix, and so um, it's very lovely. But the leaves don't fall in there, do they? If um, I don't mean the cactuses don't fall over, no. <laughs> <laughs> like the spines don't fall. No, no. <laughs> don't turn red and fall. You know, we don't have colored trees. If you go north, if you go up to like the Grand Canyon, or you go up to you know Sedona or something like that, then you'll see that the trees fall, but um, or turn colors. But uh, here in the the valley floor, mm. no. <laughs> there are no trees like that <laughs> very cool uh and leo what do you like to do for research so uh my research focuses on exoplanets and their atmospheres how they evolve through time and i do both observations and theoretical modeling of mm -hmm. this process happening at exoplanets Right, and those are some peeking out. Those are some pretty cool posters over your head there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I don't think one of them, the one about, let me see if I, yeah, this one here. It's here about. Right. It's related to what I do. It's related to flares and how it affects atmospheric escape in exoplanets. Cool. It's pretty cool. This one is about Bruce. an ultra hot planet that is actually. This is a Halloween. Both of these are Halloween themed posters that came from the nasa what is it called again um is it, is it a nasa thing where they make posters yes yes I, and i'll think of the proper name here in a minute but yeah i know what you're talking about yeah very cool very good and that is going to bring us to this very awesome aj article it is open access it's the open access era people you can go grab a copy for free go get one Hydrodynamic Atmospheric Escape in HD 189733B, Signatures of Carbon and Hydrogen Measured with the Hubble Space Telescope. And Leo, take us away. Yes. So one thing that I should have done before I started this, this interview is that I should, I think this planet actually has a name that is not the, the <laughs> phone number. No phone I think number. it actually has a name, but I didn't, I forgot to look it up. <laughs> Well, so, Frank, if you want to look it up while, while, I, while I start, because I think this plant has an IOU name. Okay. And I think we're not. Well, we'll figure, we'll figure it out here in a sec. <laughs> uh, it's better than saying the the phone number is HD 19973B. <laughs> so, this planet is fairly well known in the community that studies exoplanets because it was one of the first exoplanets to be discovered that transits. Okay. And not only that, it was not the first. I think it was one of the first ones. Yeah. And it orbits a fairly bright star. It's a nearby K-type star. Okay. And because the whole star is so bright, this planet has been observed many, many times by many different instruments, space-based instruments, ground-based instruments, with all kinds of different techniques. Um, and it was one of the targets of the... Um, of the PANSAT program. So PANSAT stands for, right, let me remind myself of the, that's an acronym, PANSAT. It's Panchromatic Comparative Exoplanetology Program with the Hubble Space Telescope. There you go. 
Uh, <laughs> so it's, so it's HSC Panzer. HSC is Hubble Space Telescope, by the way. Mm -hmm. So this was a large program to yeah. use Hubble Space Telescope. And I think it, was, it dates from 2017, if I'm not mistaken. No, no, earlier than that. I think it was 2016 um, when it was accepted. So this was a large program aimed at observing a sample of different exoplanets across a wide range of wavelengths with the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay. Uh, this why it's panchromatic, but panchromatics for a wide range of wavelengths. So we went from far ultraviolet, which is the focus of this paper, okay. down to near infrared. So okay. one of the cool things about HST or Hubble is that it can observe through this wide wavelength range from FUV, far ultraviolet, to near infrared and IR. Awesome. Um, there are different instruments. So HSC has different instruments that observe at different wavelengths. So for instance, in this paper, I use mostly one, uh, one instrument. It's called COS. It's the Cosmic Origins Spectrograph that observes in the ultraviolet. Yeah. But HSC also has another ultraviolet instrument. It's called STIS, yes. the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, mm -hmm. which I briefly touch upon in this paper, but it's not the focus. I, want, I mostly for this paper use the COS spectrograph. Okay. Um, so why are we interested in this planet in particular? It's just HD 189733B. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's really, first of all, it's, it orbits a super bright star. So it's good for observing. It's good for getting as many photons as we can. There we go. And we, when when we observe exoplanet atmospheres, we're usually observing the stellar light when it passes through the planet's atmosphere. So that there are very, very tiny changes in the stellar light that we're looking at. Yes. And when you're looking at very, very tiny changes, you need to observe a lot of photons to, to see these tiny changes. So that's why we usually like observing super bright stars that host exoplanets. And HD 189733 is one of them. Uh, and another cool thing mm -hmm. about this planet is that it has a very short orbital period. It orbits very close to the host star. Okay. And because of that, the planet is very, very hot. Yep. Which will... And yes. And we are interested in these hot planets because they go through a process called atmospheric escape, hydrodynamic atmospheric escape. Yes. Uh, so basically, any planet goes through atmospheric escape, including the Earth. The Earth also loses the atmosphere very slowly. Yes. Uh, but it's not as intense as these hot planets that we're we're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, however, when the Earth was young, same for Venus, when Venus wa was young, um, we the the Earth and Venus, they also had a very large hydrogen helium atmosphere as these hot Jupiters that we're looking at do. But they, but the Earth and Venus also lost their atmospheres through right. hydrodynamic escape. So by observing hydrodynamic oh, escape in these planets, it's kind of like studying our own past or studying, trying to understand the history of our own atmosphere. Good, cool. Yeah. So that's the main motivation to observe a planet like HD 189733B. Nice. All right. So, so yeah, it was observed uh, in the PANSAT program. And... Uh, yeah, there you go. It's uh, the PIs of this program are David Singh and Mercedes Lopez Morales, which are uh, uh, David Singh is uh, Johns Hopkins University, very close to where I am right now, and Mercedes is at uh, Harvard Center for Astrophysics. Cool. And also, if you go back to the first page, there's it's a large team. The Pensat team is uh, yeah, led led by David Singh and Mercedes. And the other people you see as authors in this paper, they're all members of the PlanSat team. Cool. A huge shout out to them. Yeah, nice international uh, team here. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, there it's a very international team. People people in astronomy tend to move a lot. Uh, including <laughs> me. I moved a lot. I moved I lived in four different countries. Awesome. So I moved I moved a lot myself. Do you and, speak four different languages? Uh, I speak too fluently and to kind of like I get around. You can order I get around with. I can buy a baguette and there you go <laughs> if I need to. Very cool. Yeah. 
All righty. Uh, so, so yeah, that was the program. And as I said before, there were many targets observed in this program. For this, prepare focus on HD 1D9733B. Mm-hmm. And I use the cosmic origin spectrograph to look at transits for yeah. this plant. So basically, the technique that we use is called transmission spectroscopy, uh-huh. which you may have heard about in this series of, of um, interviews. So what, what happens is that we wait for the planet to pass in front of the whole star. And as I said before, the stellar light it filter, filters through the atmosphere at the limbs of the planet. And when that happens, the atmosphere of the planet will absorb some some of that stellar light. And by changing by by, by studying the changes in the in their stellar spectrum uh-huh. through time, we can infer about what's happening in the atmosphere of the planet. Cool. For this paper, we focus on far ultraviolet wavelengths, which range from I guess I could just say some numbers from eleven hundred angstrom to fifteen hundred angstrom for those who speak angstrom. Yep. yep. Um, I speak ancient. <laughs> uh, all with the fairly high resolution capabilities of COS, the yeah. cosmic origin spectrograph. It's fairly high resolution. It's not too high, but it's high enough mm-hmm. where we can resolve the, the stellar emission lines. Yes. And it's important to resolve the stellar emission lines because we want to, if we detect something, especially with the kinds of features that we're trying to observe here. We usually want to see velocity fields. Yes. In order to detect velocity fields, you need high resolution, as much as much resolution as you can. Cool. Good. Now, if you go to figure one, I show the how the <laughs> spectrum of the whole star looks like. So in the top panel, you have the different by the way, so this is a cool star, it's a K-type star. Yes. It's cooler than the sun, but it's a bit hard, hotter than M dwarfs like Trappist one. So it's mm-hmm. kind of like intermediate. Yeah, for yeah. The, yeah, so for these cool stars, we don't usually have a continuum. Is the continuum is usually around zero, um, but they do have emission lines. Indeed, they do. Uh, yeah, that I'm showing here. So these are different emission lines from carbon, hydrogen, silicon, nitrogen, oxygen, um, and since we don't have a continuum flux, we look at the fluxes <laughs> of the emission lines. Okay. And on panel B, which is in the lower left, that's not a cost spectrum. That's a this spectrum. Okay. Showing more detail. It's kind of like a, a zoom in around the Lyman alpha line. The Lyman alpha line is around yeah. uh, 1,220 angstrom. It's that big, strong emission line that you see in the top. Right. You know? And the reason why why we show this is because COS has some sort of contamination from the Earth's atmosphere. Ironically, it's funny to think about it because the Earth, so the contamination that appears in this kind of data is actually from the Earth's exosphere. And okay. we're looking at exospheres from other planets. It's kind of like our own exosphere gets in the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> even though it's a space mission. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, the reason why that happens is because the exospheres, they are made of hydrogen, hydrogen and helium, mm-hmm. and some other lighter elements. And because they're very light elements, they escape the atmosphere very easily. So they start populating very high altitudes in the yes. Earth's atmosphere. Yes. Even though Hubble is at 500 kilometers altitude, there is still a lot of hydrogen above it coming from the Earth's atmosphere, coming from the atmosphere, you can say, from our own planet. Yeah. And it's that is those hydrogen atoms that produce the contamination in the Lyman alpha line. Okay. Okay. And if we had time at the end, I can show how the contamination looks like. It's in the it's in one of the appendices. Um, okay. But it's, this doesn't have that. It's, this doesn't have that contamination. Or I mean, it does have that contamination, but we can subtract it very easily. There you go. Zero. And, okay. And, yeah, and on the lower right, that's a, a zoom in on the oxygen lines. On the co- in the cost spectrum, uh, just so because I'm going to talk about the oxygen lines at a, at a later point. So Hopefully. I zoom in at that triplet exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh huh. Okay. I'm with you. Cool. And so that, there's a table. I, there's some. I'm probably going to skip the tables, but I have this table here showing the different data sets that we analyze. So there's other data sets besides the PanSat program that I list here. Mm-hmm. But we focus on the PanSat data sets. Okay. Cool. Um, so if you go to figure two, 
disappear. Okay. Results, repeat. I'm going to talk about those things. But okay. yeah, so, so these are like curves. As I said before, we're looking at transits and we wait for the planet to pass in front of the star. And when, when the planet passes in front of the whole star, we have a dip in the starlight. Mm -hmm. So in the x-axis, you have time and hours. And in the y-axis, you have the flux, which is normalized. It makes our life easier. We normalize it to the outer transit baseline. So we're looking at dips when we look at transit light curves. Mm -hmm. So the dashed line that you see there, that's the transit of the planet without an atmosphere. Okay, okay. So if the planet has an atmosphere that is absorbing at one of these wavelengths that we're looking at, yes, it will show as an additional absorption besides that dashed light curve. Yes. Uh -huh. So if the data points follow the dashed line like curve, it means there is no atmosphere or it's not detectable. Right, which is maybe not as interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if they're deeper, if they're slightly deeper than yes. the baseline like curve, then it means that there may be something there. Yes. So what I'm showing you here is the different oxygen, uh, the, the time series like curves or the different oxygen lines that we have for the whole star. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and on the lower right panel, that's a combination of all the oxygen lines. So there's a, a little bit of a dip at the e ingress of the transit. So ingress is when the planet enters First the disk. Uh, and, mm -hmm. Yeah, it enters the disk of the star and egress is when it leaves. Yes. Mm -hmm. On the lower right panel, you have a, a bit of a, an additional absorption during ingress. Mm -hmm. for the oxygen. It's very, it's, it's, it's very, so I, the way I, I phrase it in this paper is that this is a, this is very sensitive and it's very marginal. Okay. It's a, basically a two sigma dip and we don't claim detection at two sigma, if, yeah. if any. Right. Um, so we, intriguing. it is intriguing. So usually what that means is that if we want to detect a signal that is as shallow as I think about 5% in there, and with an error bar that is the size of about 2.5%, right. we either need more observations to kind of like um, combine the different observations and increase the signal to noise ratio of the final light curve. Yes. Or we observe it with a better instrument. There you go. Problem is, <laughs> a Hubble is the only <laughs> instrument that is capable of doing this at the moment. And cost is the most precise spectrograph yep. that can do th this particular star. Okay. So that's the best we can do with two Currently. transits. Currently. Cool. Um, yeah. Hopefully, in the future, we will have uh, other missions that we'll observe in far mm -hmm. spectroscopy, yes. for instance, the Habitable Worlds, Habitable Worlds Observatory, which is currently being planned in our community. Yes. And it's probably we're planning to people are planning to launch it in 2040s. I'm gonna be near my retirement. Yeah. By <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny because I'll just be graduating from uh, high school or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, so hopefully, when I'm about to retire, the tell us the Habitable Worlds Observatory HW is gonna be operating. Cool. And it's, it's going to give us a better view of the these kinds of ultraviolet lacquers that we're looking at with Hubble right now. Right. But for for the lack of a, a better instrument, what we can do is to observe more. So if you want to, anyone wants, wants to write a proposal to observe this planet again, to try to get that, well, the oxygen signal, uh -huh. go right ahead. It's a really good idea. It yeah. is. Yeah, you can, you can steal my proposal ID if you want. I'm not going to be mad about it. I'm sure you'll post it somewhere on social media somewhere. So. <laughs> All right, so we can go to the next like or the next plot, and those are going to be the carbon light curves. Okay, let's zoom this out so we get a global. Okay. Yeah. So, I kind of like if want to kind of pick apart the this plot is that we have two strong carbon lines in the cos mm -hmm. range. And we're looking at when we're looking at atmospheric escape signals mm -hmm. uh, of carbon and oxygen and other species, we're usually looking at high velocities that are blue shifted. So these are velocities that are this is basically material that is escaping the planet and coming towards us. 
Yes. Kind of like in the direction away from the star and towards us. Yes. That's how we expect the signal to appear because yeah. of a series of, it's actually a matter of debate in the community. The, the reason why atmospheric escape signals are boost shifted or they come towards us, there, there's a lot of discussion to okay. pin down what is the precise ah. mechanism that makes that happen. Ah, we okay. think it's a combination of the the atoms being accelerated by radiation pressure yes and some hydrodynamic effects but there's a lot of theoretical mm -hmm. stuff uh, so i'm not going to get on that because the focus on the paper is mostly on observations there's a bit of theory as i'm going to show later but the, the mm -hmm. focus of the paper is in observations so the cool thing uh, about the cool thing that we found in this these data sets is that we do have an absorption uh, a detectable, I think it's a three sigma detection of carbon. Much deeper. Uh, yeah. If you look at the mm -hmm. uh, middle panel left, middle that's panel. where we have the strong, yeah, that one. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's where we have the strongest absorption during the ingra ingress of the planet. Mm -hmm. um, Zoom that one. And, and it happens exactly in the blue wing of the, of the carbon line. So these are. If, if the material is escaping the planet, it's coming towards us. It's blue shifted. So that's why I separated in blue wing and red wing. Okay. Yes. And it's in that particular carbon line. So this is excited carbon. So yes. it just happens that the, the carbon atoms that are escaping the planet, they are being uh, uh, being excited to, to this particular state and it's observable. Yeah. Uh, and so time dependence. Okay, I'm with you. Yeah, there's a time dependence. I we we think there's a combination of both having planetary signal and also stellar variability. Uh and these are two okay. different, yeah, the, the yeah. two different colors are different transits. Right, are, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Visit B and C. So these are two different transits. Mm -hmm. uh, so for instance, in one transit, we see yeah, and that panel there, you have your mouse right now. Mm -hmm. Only the blue data set, we have that strong dip. Uh, but in the orange data set, we don't. Not so we much. think it's a combination of both stellar variability and potentially yeah. also planetary variability. Because mm. we have to remember that at these lines that we're looking at, we not only trace the planet's atmosphere, but you also trace stellar variability. Mm -hmm. Because these lines are formed in the chromosphere of the star, and the chromosphere trend tends to be strongly affected by stellar variability. Mm -hmm. and what, what's the time difference between visit B and visit visit C? Is it's the next one, or were, did a couple rotation periods go, orbital periods go by? It's if you go back to uh, maybe page two, I think there's a or no, to table two actually. Table two has the dates where they were observed. So visit B was 2017 June. Got it. It was 2017 July. Right. So it was about a month. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. And I, I think it was a, a couple, a few rotational periods because the star is fairly active. And I think the rotational period is fairly short. Actually, if you go to table one, I think there's a rotational period there of the star. Orbital period is two days. Uh, that's good to know. It, oh, it doesn't have the, yeah, it doesn't have the stellar rotation period. Rotational period. It has a projected rotational velocity, which is 3.5 kilometers per second. Yeah. It gives a lot of information about the, the rotational period. Right. Okay. But if anything, this is a very active, fairly active star. Um, right. So we, we have, what we are seeing could be a combination of both planetary signal and stellar variability as well. Yes. Um, and this is, again, is another subject for future research. And okay. it's a okay. fairly active future research at the moment. Stellar variability and the impact on observables and planetary atmospheres as well. Yep, big talk, big talk. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. All right. So if we go to figure three. Question, carbon. Oh, well, we are in figure three. Here's. Oh, Figure four? Yes. Figure four, yes. <laughs> All good. And dot. Oh, so these are another way of looking at planetary signals. We look at the, the actual spectra and we kind of combine the different spectra between outer transit and in transit. So basically we get all the spectra that are during the transit of the planet and those that are outer transit and we compare them. 
Good. If you look at the, I'm not going to discuss all of the different panels, but if you go to the top right panel. Top right. Yeah, you're going to see that the in-transit data, which is in orange, there's a bit of a, yeah, between velocities minus 25 and zero kilometers per second. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, minus 25. Yes. Yeah, between minus 25 and zero, you're going to see that there's a, a little dip in the orange data set. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the blue shifted signal that I mentioned before. That's yeah. the kind of signal that we're looking at. We're looking at those tiny dips in the blue wing of that emission line okay. during the planetary transit. So this is another way of confirming that this is spot, this is very likely a planetary signal. Mm -hmm. If the absorption was everywhere in the stellar line, it's so, very possible it's stellar variability. Yeah. But since it's confined to the blue shifted velocities, gotta be coming from the planet. It, uh, it, it probably comes from the planet. Cool. Very cool. Uh -huh. So yeah, that's the other the other signature that we're looking for. We so we're not only looking at the light curve that I showed before, we're also looking at the the actual spectra. And you see it in a couple different lines here. You're seeing that yeah. signal. Yeah. Yeah, right. so these are different lines. There's the oxygen lines and they're kind of like more or less same, the outer transit and in transit lines. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're not really detecting anything in them. Mm -hmm. uh, right. so our most confident, the, the detection that we're most confident about is the carbon line that we're showing the top, mm -hmm. top right now. Yep, that's got the biggest signal, yes. Yep. Okay, cool. So in fact, when I was discussing these results with, with some of my collaborators that are in this paper, uh, they were only convinced that this is a planetary signal when I showed this plot okay. <laughs> with the, the in-transit and out-of-transit spectra. Okay, so good. Just show them the light curves are going to be like, ah, it could be stellar activity. Yeah, not really anything. sure. But when I showed them this plot, that, that's kind of like, I would say that maybe that's the money plot. You're showing the okay and in-transit. Well, money plot is good. Yeah, money plot is good. <laughs> money plot gets a little more attention. and it's, it's really Yeah, important. we're looking for that. That's what we're looking for. Cool. Beautiful. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. And there, there's other planets out there that we have found the signal. For instance, there's HD 209-45AB. Also, okay. you may recognize uh, an exoplanet astronomer, an observer, because they can cite yeah, a I bunch of exoplanet names by their yes. numbers. <laughs> so what happens is that in our head, of all the exoplanet observers, we have a list of top 20 exoplanets for which we, have, we know all of their names, all of their phone numbers by heart and very cool you want it in i b is one of them hd 20945 ab is another one. another one it's a huge there's not huge but there's a list of about 20 of them that we all there we know their names by heart cool <laughs> it's a family affair very good yes all right so we can go to the next figure figure four and then we're gonna get into some of the yeah these are more likers so these are different tracers that we're looking at silicon line mm -hmm. right. so the silicon line and the the fuv continuum these are so the, the fuv continuum is not a line it's just we integrate in the entire spectrum of the whole star with yes. the exception of the emission lines so yes. we we plot likers for these features as well because they are tracers of stellar activity mm -hmm. and but there's nothing super conclusive about them anyway they're like mm -hmm. the silicon line there's there's some level of variability but it doesn't really correlate with the other lines that we were looking at. Right. Same with the FUV continuum. So when they, when they don't correlate the, these fluxes, um, we think there is not a strong selectivity contamination in our data set. <laughs> Good. I'm with you. Right. Mm -hmm. And figure six is similar in Likers, but these are. Um, Lyman alpha like so we're look this is looking at hydrogen escape not carbon not, not oxygen yes um so the, the cool thing about the Lyman alpha line is that it's stronger so we can we have more photons to look at yeah there's a big significant those ratios yep and we do know from previous observations that this planet has um a hydrogen escaping from mm -hmm. previous observations with the Hubble space telescope that I show here as the STIS data. So STIS data is the other UV instrument on HST. Uh, where we, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, and where we have this this extra absorption. Remember that the dashed curve is the transit of the planet if it didn't have an atmosphere. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. So that additional absorption that we see in transit is because of the presence of hydrogen atoms escaping the planet. Nice. We see that it goes down to about 10%. Mm -hmm. this data set and same for the cost data set as well which is in show, shown as, as the different colors we see okay. that it dips during the ingress of the planet yes uh, to about seven percent yeah uh, yeah absorption what's kind of unfortunate about these data sets is that we caught the ingress and egress of the planet so right when it was coming in front of the sign then leaving the star and we don't have data in between those two data points Right what now. happens is that Hubble, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope orbits the Earth. Yeah. So when it goes uh, behind the Earth, it cannot observe anything. Which just uh, happened to coincide with this one. <laughs> yeah. So we don't have data in between the ingress and egress for the two visits that we had. Rats. Because the, the space telescope is passing behind the Earth and we cannot observe our star. Right. So that's why we don't have data in between those two data two hours. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Okay. That's, that's one of the, by the way, this is one of the limitations of Hubble. And, and we don't have that kind of limitation with James Webb, for instance. James Webb can stare at our targets as much as it wants. L2. Yep. Because it, yeah, because it's L2. It's not orbiting the Earth. No. Yep. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah. How are you doing on time, by the way? No, we're doing great. All right. Um, so if you go to the next figure, by the way, there are some tables in there showing the different uh, levels of absorption that we're observing uh, in this planet. Um, and the most confident detection that we have is uh, singly ionized carbon. And that's basically the summary of that, uh, of that table. Now for the next part of this paper, I focus a little bit on the one dimensional modeling. So when we observe atmospheric escape in planets like HD 189733b, it's not only about the observation, we want to interpret that those observations with the model. Yep. And that's precisely what we did. So we used a one-dimensional escape model. That it, so the, the model that we use is very similar actually to the solar wind, because these are we're uh -oh. essentially observing yeah. all flows and winds in planets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we uh, we constructed a model that is based on the old but, but gold solar wind model, the Parker wind model from 1958. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. one of the most cited papers I've ever seen. It has almost 5,000 citations. That paper is, is awesome. Go, you and it, works, it works great for modeling outflows in planets, even though it was made for outflows in stars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the outflow for the sun. Mm -hmm. It works great for planets. And we use that model to interpret our observation. Okay. So basically, we inject a hydrogen and helium and some other species in the wind of the planet. Okay. And we calculate the different profiles, um, the number of densities of these species yes. in function of radius away from the planet, basically in function of altitude, which is measured by the X axis. Right. Mm -hmm. This right. Is height above uh, photosphere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are several radii above, planetary, above the planet's surface. Yes. Uh, so we're basically tracing very high altitudes. Mm -hmm. Cool. So larger than the planet itself. Cool. And we see that the number of densities of different species that we're looking at, which are uh, neutral oxygen, singly ionized oxygen in blue, and in orange we have sing, uh, neutral carbon and singly ionized carbon in orange. Yes. And we're looking at the number of densities and function of planetary radius, oh. planetary altitude. That's what I want. And on the the right panels are the different uh, yeah. states that the at, these atoms can be in ground state, first excited state, second excited state, and that's kind of the nitty gritty of modeling. But we need that kind of information to model the signals that we're looking at. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, well, the cool thing is that we have this model based on the on the solar wind to calculate those profiles for us. So we take these profiles, we do some radiative transfer magic. So basically, yeah. we inject the planetary atmosphere or the planetary outflow in front of the star. Yes. And we do the radiative transfer, which is basically calculating how much stellar light is absorbed when it goes through the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And we fit and we modify our model in order to match the, the depth of the planetary transit that, we're, that we yeah. observe. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. 
And based on all of that, we can extract a mass loss rate for the planet, which uh -huh. is one of the inputs for a, the, yeah. the, the outflow model. So yeah. if you go to the next plot, figure eight, mm. that's, uh, that shows our model. So model we've, we calculated a few different models, model one, two, three. Um, and model, let me remind myself, I think model three, it was a, a model calculated by the second author, Antonio Garcia Munoz. It was okay. kind of like a self-consistent model. And all the other ones are the Parker Wind model that I mentioned, the models one and two. Okay. And what we're gonna see, so the, the, we calculate these absorption uh, models based on those profiles that, that we simulated. Yes. And then we compare the level of absorption from the model to the observed data set. Okay. Um, and when they match, we can extract a mass loss rate for our planet. M dot. Yes, the M dot. That's usually what we're looking for. When we study planetary evolution and atmospheric escape, the main parameter that we're searching for is M dot. Okay. And for this planet, we conclude that it's about uh, one. I mean, it's, it's a huge number. It's 10 to the power of 11 grams per second. It's the unit that people use for uh, planetary science, atmospheric escape. So for exoplanets, we started using the same units, grams per second. Yes. But for exoplanets that are really hot, the numbers that we get are so, so large, like 10 to the 11 grams per second. While, for instance, I think for the Earth, the atmospheric escape of the Earth is about 10 to the 4 grams per second, if I'm not mistaken. Uh -huh. Somewhere around there. Yeah, if I'm mistaken, planetary science is going to punch me in the face in five minutes. That's okay. But yeah, it's... They can blame me. Yeah, it's about those orders of magnitude. So it's several orders of magnitude difference between the escape rate that we see for solar system planets, those that we observe in these super hot planets that we're looking at. Um, and so that's the main takeaway of the planet is... Beautiful. We observed it would cause... We see a, a detection of ionized carbon escaping the planet. And then we can, based on that observation, apply some models to the observation, we can extract a mass loss rate for the planet that is consistent with previous yeah. studies. Uh-huh. Very cool. Because this planet was observed by other programs looking at, for instance, metastable helium escape. And we obtained okay. a very, very similar atmospheric escape rate uh, with previous studies. Nice. Good. So, so it all tells sort of a consistent story. Though. Yeah, it's consistent. So it's it's looking good. Um, and uh, no. I guess we could take a quick look at the appendices. So when I when I mentioned that the cost, yeah, those plots. Yeah, when I mentioned that cost, the cost factor has contamination uh -huh. by the air glow by the Earth's exosphere. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the left panel. Those are the different levels of contamination that we have in different orbits, and on the right plot. That's, yeah. yeah, we fit. So the orange curve is wow. a fit. It's a model for the wow. planet, for the yeah. Earth's air globe that we fit to our data, and then we remove it. Yeah. And when we remove the contamination, we get the plot in black. Mm -hmm. so that's the stellar lemon alpha line without the, the Earth's contamination. Got it. Yeah. And that's what we that's what we use to, to study the planet in lemon alpha. Very but it's only necessary for costs for the CIS instrument on HSC. We don't need to do all of this fitting and nothing because it's mm -hmm. automatically removed by the by the pipeline. Okay. Okay. And to circle back to stellar activity, if we look at the last plot of this, sure. of the, sort of a classic. Uh, oh wait, it's it's a bit above. E, I'll get there. Yeah, that one. Uh huh. Classic uh -huh. plots here, people. Yeah. So on the top panel. We have arrows showing the visits B and C, which are the ones that we analyze yes. in, in this in this paper. Okay. And it show the the what you're observing here in this top top panel is the time series, pho photometry time series of the whole star through different for a range of time. And we see that in visits B, at least for visit B, yeah, it's kind of like so if you imagine there's a sinusoidal curve tracing the stellar activity levels. Okay, I'll imagine that. Yeah, so visit B is kind of like at the low point in the stellar activity. 
Mm, yes. But we think that for visit B, we don't have a strong cell activity contamination. But visit C is kind of like in between high level and low level cell activity. Mm, um, yeah. Yeah. So we, we think that there could be some contamination in visit C, but not much in visit B. Oh, this is also this can also be seen in the third panel where we phase folded all of this data phase set. Fold. Here we go. Yeah. The we phase folded the photometry and we see that visit B is at the low point of oh, there we go. color spottedness. That's a, it's a measure for cell activity. Visit B is right at that low point and visit C yep. is between. Um, so we think there could be some contamination for by cellular activity in our data, okay. but at least for visit B, not as much as visit C. Okay. All right. And uh, that, that is the, the gist of this paper. Very, very cool. Very nice. Leo, I want to thank you so much for walking us through this. Very awesome. It's my pleasure. Cool. 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 Um, and you mentioned it a couple times. Uh, as you were going through, and of course, there was a little bit there at the end of the paper. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, <clears throat> but uh, let me ask: um, you know, where do you where do you think we go from here over, let's say, the next two to five years? Are there other systems in the famous twenty, the golden twenty that everybody knows that one could apply <laughs> this analysis to? Is is there uh, you know other wavelengths one could look at? Is there other instruments? JWST got mentioned. Um, and just sort of what are in theoretical modeling, maybe there needs to be, you know, a little more self-consistency on some of that. Yeah. Um, so just sort of next steps, where do you think we go with this over the next two to five years? Yeah. So this is a great question. I think it's a very exciting moment to do this kind of research right now. Atmospheric escape has been, it was, it's kind of started, like if you, if you ask me about 10 years ago, atmospheric escape was super niche. In exoplanets, very few people were studying. It was mostly some people from France and some small groups here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And the this this subfield of atmospheric escape has kind of blown in the last few years with the discovery of the helium line as a tracer for for atmospheric escape. That's very cool. Um, so there's a lot to do. There's many observations to be made. Uh, if you want to observe atmospheric escape, you can use ground-based observatories, not necessarily space telescope, HST or JWST. You can do it from the ground using near-infrared spectroscopy at high resolution. You can do it uh, from the northern hemisphere using CAC or the southern hemisphere using other instruments. There is instruments at the European Southern Observatory that can, that can so. do that. Mm -hmm. And as you said, for the the list of the of our favorite twenty planets, not all of them have been observed yet for okay. atmospheric escapes. Um, there's a lot of stuff to do. There's other planets that are excellent for these kind of observations that we are just not aware yet. Especially with tests discovering new transiting exoplanets, oh, many yeah. are, many of the tests exoplanets are excellent to observe atmospheric escape. Cool for bo both the HST, JWST, <clears throat> or the ground, JWST. Um, it does observe atmospheric escape in the helium line in the near infrared at one micron. The I would say the disadvantage of observing JWST is that it doesn't have a very high spectral resolution, so we don't resolve the planetary absorption. Yeah, and it makes the interpretation observations a bit trickier. Yeah, but but I think that's where modeling advances will come in because we will need self-consistent models that will help us deal with the the fact that we don't resolve the planetary absorption so we cannot measure the the outflow temperature so we have a degeneracy that we have to deal with but more self-consistent models don't have that degeneracy yes there's a lot of work to do in improving these models making them more self-consistent so that they don't have many um input parameters as we currently have we there's a lot of improvement to do in theoretical models in making them because most of the, the previous models that we've done before they're more appropriate for hot Jupiters, okay. And we want to make them work better for smaller planets like planets mm -hmm. that are sub Neptunes that are smaller than Neptune, maybe mm -hmm. even Earth sized. For instance, there's one planet, there's a super Earth planet where we have seen escape of carbon. Ooh. Um, okay. So there's a lot to do in both observations mm -hmm. and models. 
of atmospheric escape. It's a very exciting view to be in. Yeah. It's a very exciting time to be in. Very cool. And I really look forward to seeing this topic evolve over the next couple of years because there's yeah. a lot of opportunities all over the place on this one. So yeah, very, very cool. Yeah. Theo, thank you so much once again. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. And that will do everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.